what's the key to making changes in your community? Well, Carla has the info you need. Carla is heavily involved in the Filipino community. Whether in social or economic aspects, she's dedicated to making a difference. She shares her inspirations and how you too can get involved on this episode of You Talk. Let's get into it. First of all, thanks, Ryan, for uh, thinking about me and uh, inviting me to the show. Um, I'm Carla Atanasio. I'm a 1.5 generation Filipino Canadian. So for folks who don't know what that means, that means that I spent the first few years of my life uh, in the Philippines. That's where I grew up and then moved to Canada at a, at a young age. And since then, I've kind of made it my home and I've made a point to really engage with the Filipino community here. Because if there's one thing that's unique about Manitoba, it's the social fabric of our Filipino community. So for those who don't know, Manitoba is home to one of the largest Filipino populations in Canada. It's so exciting to see it, like going to different events like uh, Taste of Asia that happened, like how many different Filipino vendors and food trucks there were. Yeah, there were. there's so many. And again, you know, it's not just one community organization putting it together, but there's multiple, you know, Filipino entrepreneurs that are starting their own ventures and bringing along other folks for the ride, which I think is is really unique to Manitoba. It's just so fun, like going to the Sea Bear Games, like last year when they're celebrating uh, Filipino Independence Day. And we're I think they're going to be doing that again uh, this year. And it's just it's exciting and it's a growing community. And yeah, as a community grows and establishes like it's going to have to meet the needs of the community as well. It's great to see all of this representation and all of the events and and conversations that we're having about, you know, not only being Filipino Canadian, but but trying to dissect like, OK, we're we're in Canada where we are also not just immigrants, but also settlers in, in this land. And I'm, I'm really seeing that a lot of younger people are uh, more interested in, in having those difficult conversations because it's it's great that we have these songs and dances and, and business ventures, but I think introspection about really our, our place in Canada is happening at a rapid pace as well. And that's something that I... I'm really looking forward to as the months and the years kind of pass by. And in the state of the world, I think that's very, very important. Yeah, you know, everything we see about like uh, indigenous communities, like when we're talking about settlement, like people who have been here a long time, but their families came from overseas. And of course, things are different now in that settlement process. But it's important to have those conversations and build communities with Indigenous folks, like I, th- I think Manitoba has one of the largest indigenous populations yeah. as well. And, you know, we see those communities struggling. And as we keep building up each of our own communities, you know, we have to help and uplift each other as well. For a lot of people, they, they come here as immigrants and there's always a lot of pride in, you know, moving from halfway across the world to this new place, right, where you're presented all these jobs and opportunities and you have, you know, the opportunity to start your own life. And I think the misconception is that, uh, you know, some people get, quote unquote, handed opportunities. But again, based on my conversations that I've had with people, there's a a bigger understanding that some folks do need an extra upliftment in order to get them to where they need to be. And I think that's the main uh, driving force behind a lot of community organizations here in Manitoba. Like, for example, with our work for uh, the Manitoba Filipino Business Council, which I am one of the directors of, one of the things that we really want to distribute to the community is the fact that Loans are not necessarily a bad thing because in our culture, borrowing money like that's always difficult because you don't want to put your place, you know, in a spot where it's impossible for you to move forward. We also talk about grants. And just because you're asking for grants doesn't mean that, you know, you're asking for money. Like, yes, I guess technically that's what it means. It, but it feels a little different. It feels right? a little different. Uh, there's like definitely some negative connotations within the community about about those things. But uh, I think it's just a matter of framing and helping them understand that these opportunities are are here for them. Um, and it's something that, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't pass, especially if it's it's being offered. It's that conversation of like 
equity and equality, right? It's like, oh, everyone gets a bike, but not everyone can ride the bike. And sometimes you have to modify the bike to help people get to that spot. It's great to see that these conversations are happening within the Filipino Business Council because I I feel it's important. And, you know, we're starting to have those conversations, you know, as a larger society now, but Sometimes it feels incredibly slow and it's like, why are we only starting to make these baby steps now in 2024? Exactly. And I think, you know, it it is something that uh, takes a lot of time. It's a culture shift, right? I think a lot of us, especially with with immigrant or working class parents, they really pride themselves in like pulling themselves up, you know, by, by the bootstraps. But uh, in in the world that we live in today, some some people have more, and and others are finding it a lot harder to establish themselves. And so, asking for help, I think uh, it's it's in it's in, and we need to do that a lot more. What what is the word baya uh, baya nihan? Or the is word community? baya nihan community. It's it's an expression that you know it expresses basically in cooperation. It, it came from. An etymology, Mabayan means country or village. And, you know, when you're saying that you're engaging in Bayanihan, it means that you are coming together with other community members to achieve some kind of shared or common goal. And I think it's really, really beautiful that we can set aside our differences, but also connect um, towards a common goal. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's incredibly important now in it just feels like politics and things are becoming even more polarized than ever. Sometimes I don't even dare to look at the comment section when I'm like scrolling on TikTok or God forbid I ever go on X uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anymore. And I, I mean, I hate to harp on it, but it always feels like COVID was kind of a breaking point for a lot of people where that sense of community and unity was completely severed. I've been having such a hard time to connect with people, to get people out. Yeah, I understand things are harder than ever and you want to keep busy. But, you know, if you just are always in that I'm trying to survive mentality, you suffer. And then the community suffers as well because no one feels like they're a part of anything. That they belong. I think you make a good point about COVID and, you know, this lack of physical spaces. Because even now, you know, I try to go to a fast food chain uh, where before, you know, you can order your food and then you can kind of hang around a little bit. But now they've taken away plugs, you know, to make sure that once you're done eating, you're out the door. And I think there's there's a lack of physical space, really, where you can engage with other people that doesn't require spending money, that doesn't oh, yeah. require a membership fee. Uh, and it's one thing that we're looking at in the Filipino community. We're trying to think of some kind of community center or uh, a business hub that also offers you know, extracurricular activities, whether that would be you know, offering a dance studio or maybe a pottery class or something that is sustainable but also equitable to a lot of community members. So it's called Mabuhay District, and it's very much at its infancy stages right now. But what we really envision is that this would be a space where, where Lolos and Lolas, your grandmas and your grandpas, could take, you know, their their grandchildren and introduce them to Filipino culture at the same time, support local businesses. Mm -hmm. And at this time, again, it's at its its infancy. But what we're really trying to get is the opinion of the folks who are going to use this space. So in the next couple of months, we're going to be rolling out some surveys and we're going to be doing some town halls so that we can get the input from folks who will be interested in utilizing, but also, you know, maybe renting a space and, and seeing how this could go. If we want things to bounce back, we need more people to come. Like, it's probably not just me who's frustrated when you look out of like, oh, let's go shopping somewhere. Your only options are the big chains. And it's like, or you're like, oh, I'd like to order something. But when you do look locally, it's like, oh, I can't find that thing because maybe that niche isn't within that uh, local economy at the moment. And that can be incredibly frustrating. Uh, So yeah, having those spaces is great. And just continuing on that conversation of those third spaces, I've seen so many videos online talking about the death of them and how it dramatically affects people. Because you know, you go home, 
and then work. And sometimes it's hard to disconnect mm -hmm. those two parts, especially when I know a lot of people really enjoy, you know, remote working, not having to go anywhere. But I found for myself, sometimes it was impossible to disconnect myself from the workday. Mm -hmm. And then you can never relax, you can never let go. And it's frustrating. Like there's so many places in the like cities and development. And I know the city just announced that it's going to be working with several different indigenous communities about green spaces and biodiversity uh, policies. And I'm very interested to see that because I'm all about green spaces and naturalizing within urbanization. Mm -hmm. I think there's so much we could do with our spaces that we're not doing. And it's like not even talking about from like any specific area, but like even from a capitalistic perspective, we're not using our land efficiently or cost effectively. So like, why not? Why, why not, not develop it? Yeah, I know there's a lot of talks, obviously, about the federal government, you know, investing a lot more in developing, especially in the downtown core, more housing. And I think there's definitely room to integrate more green spaces mm -hmm. and for folks to remember that we used to live in completely green spaces. And it's it's very healing uh, to know that there's places like the leaf, right, that even in the winter, you can enjoy these kind of gifts from nature. Like for me, I grew up in the Philippines where it's very tropical. And I remember stepping into the leaf for the first time. This was in November. It was snowing outside. But as soon as I stepped in, I was like, oh, my gosh, it's totally humid here. And then I saw the banana tree and started identifying all these little plants that used to be in my grandma's backyard. And I felt like, oh my God, like I am home. The only thing about that obviously is that despite investments from all three levels of government and obviously the Assiniboine Park Conservancy, it's still not a space that is free, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to a regular park. So I'm hoping that in the future there could be more opportunities to to open up that space for everyone to enjoy. Yeah, right? it's it's all about those baby steps. Yeah, it's a it's an option, but yeah, there is that barrier. Also, it's kind of far away for people who don't have a vehicle mm -hmm. to try and get there. That's like the conversation of getting more transportation. I know that's a big conversation that's happening in rural communities about having access to transportation because a lot of people move there. They don't have their license, and what are you supposed to do? It's like, how am I supposed yeah, to, how do you get to get to work? A, point B. And there's no buses or anything like that. So, I mean, I know the transit system just announced like some additions and changes to their like Transit Plus system, which is exciting and is a step. But I'd like to see things go so much further in Winnipeg. Like we used to have trolleys and systems like that, and it's it's kind of disappointing now when you just see everything's developed around cars. And I mean, for everyone listening, I've harped on this so many times. I hate cars. Like, okay, I love cars, but I hate them. I think it's fun to drive around and having spaces like that is for fine. I'm not saying that everywhere has to be zero cars, but it'd be nice to see cities take more of that urban planning and walkable ideas. Like there's so many really beautiful cities in like Europe I mean, Europe's facing its own economic problems right now, but their their city development just feels so nice. And it's so quieter when you don't have just traffic everywhere around. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Again, because North America, we are a city that, Winnipeg especially, we're a city that's built around cars, you know, like that's unfortunate to say. But I think, you know, especially after World War II, a lot of folks were you know, kind of were sent back home and now uh, they had to start their families. And so governments basically give that, gave them spaces in the suburbs where they can do exactly that. And that kind of perpetuated itself over and over again, that we think that that is the natural course of things, but it's not like that was, that was in the 1950s. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, there's there's a lot of ways in which we can we can lobby government, we could start organizing within our communities. It's just that when you see it every day and you see the inefficiencies of the transit system, you start believing that there's no better path forward. But there is. They probably don't make it as accessible, but you can simply show up to your counselor's office, 
Guys, the city city government, I know we like to complain a lot about federal politics, mm -hmm. but the city government is actually the government that you and I deal with in our day-to-day -day lives. And if there's someone that we want to engage, first point of contact should be your city councilor. Um, I know there's lots of complaints about potholes and uh, just a road work and garbage pickup, uh, but... You know, we're, we're forgetting that there are people that we can talk to and, you know, try to, to lobby and negotiate. That's something I need to take advantage of more and like act as you preach, <laughs> right? Like I need to go in, sit in council meetings because they're pretty empty. When I used to cover uh, council meetings for uh, Morden and the arm of Stanley, I'd be the only person there. Mm -hmm. And that was for work. So, yeah, we need to connect with our our local um, policymakers, uh, and especially as we move forward, because, you know, I feel a lot of times there's decisions that I'm like, why the heck would they make this decision? This doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense. Like the whole thing with like um, Portage in Maine and opening it up and like looking into it, it's like, okay, if the tunnels were going to be so expensive to maintain, why they even bother building them in the first place when we have walkable areas up top and like different pathways. It's like, why wasn't that decide? I like, I just don't know sometimes. <laughs> and it's not like they make it easy to, to explain, right? And so the people who get to make the decisions are people who are in the know. And sometimes the people that are in the know, unfortunately, they, they don't necessarily reflect what it is that we actually need as a public, right? And I, I know it's easier said than done, but you know, to do a little research, I'm sure there are lots of advocacy groups that you can join in. I know it's kind of daunting, but I, I think it gets easier, especially if you're working with a collective. Way back before COVID, there was an organization, I want to say they're the Green Action Manitoba. I might be getting the name wrong, but, you know, we would we would sit down at, uh, at the Goodwill, rest in peace, Goodwill, but you know, over pints and some good conversations, we actually came up with some solutions um, as to how we can solve, you know, solve the climate crisis. And even though those were small scale suggestions, I think a lot of us, you know, kind of took that in our day to day lives and, and, and started integrating that. So it doesn't have to be a, a formal thing. You don't have to have a law degree in order to start organizing. You just have to really hate something and then <laughs> let your frustration fuel your passion yeah grassroots movements are so important and that's why we've seen like a change in labor movements and unionization lately we're seeing people that are trying to work together because it's hard like it can feel like an impossible task if you're wanting when we're just talking about cleaning up a neighborhood when it's just you you're like why even bother and i know with everything that goes on it's so easy to become doomer or become black pilled about the world. Yeah. It's like everything's messed up. Why even bother? Things are just going to get worse. But you know, even if we can make small changes now, it could have massive ramifications in the future and change. Like, okay, maybe thing, things are probably going to get worse. <laughs> you know, like, like, let's be honest, uh, things do not look optimistic right now. But if we can make enough changes, even small changes now, maybe in two to 300 years, maybe people are starting to see those effects and things are taking that turn. Yeah, it's so easy to be hopeless about a lot of things. And I, I totally understand why that could be the case. Try to look up from your phone and <laughs> and try to connect with, with people because I bet you that you have a lot more in common than oh, yeah. you would actually think these things are so dangerous <laughs> yeah your phones oh my gosh i i'm i'm trying to control my phone usage they literally make it impossible for you to to put it down and especially with everything so integrated now emails texts you have to be reached via phone so not having it is you know very disadvantageous but you know try try to connect with people i think that's the most important thing and i mean with with polarization right it's the algorithms literally taking um, whatever data or, or habits that, you know, or news, whatever posts oh, man. that you It consume. is so scary how fast yeah. things. I went to the pet store and I just Googled the pet store, went there, picked up pet food, came back, 
all pet ads. The whole, yep, pet <laughs> ads on my TikTok. And I'm like, this is, it, just from one Google search, that's all it's giving me now. Yeah, it's, it's tough because, I mean, technology, again, it's moving really, really quickly. And even our lawmakers can't even keep up with the amount of innovation that, that goes on to these things. But it's, it's hard. You know, I try. I have a little brother. He's, he's eight years old. And as much as I try to monitor his phone usage, it's still pretty tough, again, because he's being fed all these things that the algorithm thinks he'd like. So I'm just like, I'm praying that he doesn't become <laughs> red-pilled or whatever, <laughs> yeah. uh, because he's, he's too young for that. And the world is too, too beautiful to, you know, to believe that exactly. it is otherwise. And I notice myself doing it all the time. I'm watching a show. It's like, are you watching? Yeah. 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 It's like, no, <laughs> put that away. It's so hard because it's like, and it just feels feeds that dopamine because when you don't have it, you're not being stimulated at all times. You're like, ah, what am I doing? I have to be alone with my thoughts? Wait a minute. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's intense, but you know, it's important to, it's that sense of discipline, not to say that, you know, too much discipline is a bad thing, but you know, it's okay to have discipline in some moments. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could even be as simple as, you know, maybe doing the dishes without music or a podcast going on. Like try to take back some of that autonomy like you can have a thought without mark zuckerberg yeah <laughs> you know go for a walk without it. the phone yeah yeah you will be fine you will make it back home but again easier said than done but baby steps i think is what's the most important and that willingness to to try like it's obviously going to be very hard and it's something i struggle with every day still but you know one one successful thing one small successful thing is is better than you know maintaining this uh, this charade of you know being being a drone. <laughs> Carla, we've talked about a lot of different topics, but one of the core things is being involved in community. For yourself, why do you want to be involved in the community? Why do you take time out of your day, get involved, and be active? Yeah, uh, that's a super great question. So I'm for the readers or listeners that are, are listening to this. Uh, I'm a part of a lot of community organizations. Uh, I've had a pleasure of, you know, meeting a lot of amazing folks that are also passionate about their communities and their concerns. And I think for myself, uh, I'm very involved in the Filipino Canadian community. And I started doing that when, like, I first landed to Canada. The immediate thing that I did was to look up Filipino youth serving organizations. And um, it might have taken me to the fourth page of Google until I found one, <laughs> but it truly changed my life because the one thing that I wanted to to see for myself is to connect with people who have um, not maybe not the exact same life experiences, but people who I could relate to. And it it was people from Anak or Aksyon ng ating kabataan uh, that introduced me to this world of Filipino-Canadian youth movements. And from there, it really opened a lot of doors into other organizations that not just serve youth, but the wider Filipino community. And then that opened the doors to Pinoy's on Parliament, which is a, a, a the Filipino Canadian, the largest Filipino Canadian youth leadership organizations in the country, uh, and I found them through a knock. I was actually a shoe in. They just wanted somebody from Manitoba, but they were yeah. actually at capacity already. And being part of Pinoy's in Parliament, and eventually being a chairperson of that organization. Again, opened a lot of doors to other um, Filipino organizations that are outside of Manitoba that are now serving, um, you know, more nationally focused uh, issues. And again, maybe when I was 15 or 16, I, uh, I wanted to just feel like I belonged. That was that was the bottom line. But I also took a lot of pleasure in making a difference in in the community and and seeing that you know these actions that I am taking a is actually inspiring others to create their own movements or maybe join a campaign and b I think it personally I get a lot of self you know kind of like actualization pleasure from seeing yeah it's that my sense work. of purpose yeah, yeah that like Actually, I am not traversing the world alone. Like other people are seeing the things that I'm seeing and I'm making a contribution, however little 
you know, I am because in the grand scheme of things, we're we're dust in the wind, you know. <laughs> but it's it's through community, through connection, and through you know coming together that you know life feels like it just has a lot more meaning. Uh, and so you know, it's it's very important that we in our day-to-day lives try to find little pockets of community. Like it doesn't have to be a membership club, you know, it could be a running club. It could be a group of friends that you meet at a cafe and you start a book club. It doesn't have to be a big thing, but you know, just something that, that reminds you that you're not put into this world to suffer alone. I think that's, that's the biggest thing for me. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, taking those moments and it, it could change your life. Truly, truly. And again, like I, I wouldn't have the opportunity to host um, Mabuhai TV here on You Multicultural if I hadn't met Tita Lourdes, who I met uh, when she was first starting out her her business. At the time, she was, uh, she was organizing... I think one of the beta versions of Test of, <laughs> Taste of Asia, and and she saw me, you know, volunteering for Filipino heritage uh, organizations, and she tapped me as a, as one of the organizers. And even then, I was like, okay, this this sounds kind of cool. And then fast forward five six years later, and you know, now we're we're interviewing other Filipino folks that are doing cool stuff. So you really never know where these con conversations, these connections might take you. If someone's trying to uh, or wanting to reach out and uh, find out more about yourself or to find out about opportunities within the community to get involved with, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, so I'm, I'm on Instagram. I'm probably the most active on there. So you can find me at 0KAY. K-A-R-L-A. That's OK Carla with a zero in front. Um, and there's so many opportunities out in the community, especially if you're a young person that's trying to find yourself in the world. Some things coming up. Cultivation Festival that's happening August 19 to 25. Uh, I'm serving as one of the directors this year. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring together a bunch of 1.5 second generation Filipino Canadian folks uh, who are passionate about food, arts, music, and dance. And we're doing a bunch of activations around Winnipeg. Um, If you're interested in politics or maybe civil service or you just want to find yourself. There's Pinoy's on Parliament, which is a national conference for Filipino Canadians that happen every February. It's free. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to meet a lot of other Filipino Canadian youth. And if you're a business owner uh, and you're trying to find grants and loans and maybe some advice on how to start a, a, a business plan, hit up Manitoba Filipino Business Council. So all of those organizations can be found on Instagram, on Facebook, and there are also websites um, that uh, we utilize. Amazing. Thanks for coming in. And I mean, what an amazing conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Ryan. This was a lot of fun. And folks, you know, if you're thinking about joining a club or a group, show up as yourself. And I'm sure a lot of people will be lucky to have you. Have any stories you'd like us to share or communities we should highlight? Leave a comment on our social media or reach out to us on our website. I'm Ryan Funk. This was You Talk. And have yourself a good one.